Welcome everybody to this uh, second installment of uh, CID mini series. So we will have three speakers today. They are my former colleague, MJ, and my lifelong friends. Talking about a case I have zero contribution. <laughs> Uh, we, we, our, our first speaker is Amy Xia. She's a Vice President of the Center for Design and Analysis at Amgen. I just want to mention, because we just came back from JSM, she is an elected fellow of American Statistical Association, and she is also used to be the Vice Chair of the Beijing Scientific Working Group, has contributed so much to the community and the Beijing scientific um, research work. Our second speaker is Mei Mao. She's the executive director of Biostatistics at Amgen. She's the lead uh, head of a design and innovation group in the Center for Design Analysis. Last but not least, our uh, third speaker, Tony Zhang, is the director of Biostatistics in Center for Design and Analysis at Amgen. So without further ado, let's hear from them. Thanks. Okay, thanks, uh, Frida, for the nice introduction. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's really great to be here. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Frida and uh, the Bayesian Scientific Working Group KOL Lecture Subteam for inviting us uh, to this session on um, Complex Innovative Design, or CID. Um, on behalf of the Amgen team, um, May, Tony, and I uh, will talk about a CID uh, for a phase two study on a disease called uh, systemic lupus erythematosus uh, or lupus um, based on a Amgen investigational drug um, called uh, AMG 592. Um, this design was accepted by the FDA as one of the CID pilot programs about two years ago, and we'll share our uh, experience and the considerations for this case study today. Uh, also, you can find, I want to mention, you can find additional information published by FDA about this case study uh, on their CID pilot program portal as well. Uh, so the next slide, please. So we'll break this talk by three parts. Um, um, first, I'll give some background information about the CID pilot program and the rationale why we did this design and uh, some interactions we had with FDA and also the benefits gained from this design. Um, then May will discuss the actual study design and uh, also how we address uh, four principles uh, emphasized in the FDA adaptive design guidance uh, during our D CID discussions. Uh, finally, Tony will discuss more detail on simulations, simulation report. Um, also, Amgen has developed a R Shiny app uh, specifically for this uh, design. And uh, Tony will also do a quick uh, demo about this uh, Shiny app. Next slide. Just to give some background about the CID pilot program, uh, this pilot program uh, fulfills a performance goal under PDUFA 6, aiming to facilitate and advance the use of novel clinical trial designs that support the uh, development and the regulatory review of uh, new therapeutics. Uh, designs under the CID umbrella include, but are not limited to complex adaptive, Bayesian, and other novel uh, trial designs, uh, which often require simulations to determine the statistical and other properties of the trial. And the program provides uh, two additional meetings uh, to discuss a specific CID proposal. FDA can select up to two proposals per quarter for a period of five years. Um, and this program will continue under PDUFA 7. Next slide. 
So in late October 2020, Amgen announced that it has completed trial design discussions through uh, two CID pilot program meetings with FDA for its planned phase two trial for AMG 592. Um, as I mentioned, it's an investigational product for lupus treatment. Um, the, this CID participation is based on a innovative adaptive clinical trial design uh, really uh, developed to foster the acceleration of a potential therapeutic option that could benefit patients uh, living with lupus. Next slide. Uh, so what is lupus? Um, it is a complex chronic autoimmune disease that can impact multiple organ systems, uh, which affects about 5 million people globally. Uh, it's a terrible disease. Uh, despite currently available uh, treatments, uh, patients with lupus continue to experience uh, flares and uncontrolled disease. Um, this persistently active disease is associated with a high degree of uh, organ damage and the mortality. And uh, this disease affects both women and men, um, but mostly young women during their productive years. Um, it can affect any organ in the body. And the signs and symptoms can include the painful and the swollen joints, uh, extreme fatigue, uh, horrible skin rashes, uh, anemia, and uh, kidney problems. Next slide. So based on what I just described, you can all see that lupus is a particularly heterogeneous disease. Um, the uh, heterogeneity of this disease is the foundational barrier to success in drug development uh, due to lack of user-friendly, sensitive, and accu accurate outcome measures and a lack of specific assessment of organ systems or symptoms. And the lupus is a very difficult disease, uh, not only to study, but also to recruit uh, with many competing uh, clinical trials. And a part of this is also that uh, lupus is uh, disproportionately affects minority populations and they tend to be underrepresented in our studies. Uh, we also have to deal with uh, suboptimal outcome measures uh, due to high variability and the high um, control response rate. The next, next slide. So these uh, challenges have led to a high development failure rates uh, of potential therapeutics and uh, highlight the need for innovative trial design to improve uh, development efficiency and the probability of success. Um, so in these uh, designs, uh, we want to make the most efficient use of uh, clinical trial data to simultaneously inform uh, those selection and also generate adequate and well-controlled evidence on efficacy and safety. And we want to reduce the probability of inconclusive trial and enable early and accurate decision-making. Uh, of course, we want to shorten the time to bring uh, new, therapy, uh, new therapies to patients. Next slide. So this slide shows the CID pilot program timeline uh, and high level process uh, per information posted on the CID uh, pilot program portal. So the date a sponsor submits the CID meeting request is considered day zero. Uh, around day 45, FDA will notify the sponsor whether to proceed to disclosure discussion or the request is denied. Um, by day 80, FDA and the sponsor either reach a disclosure agreement and then meeting is granted, or if not, uh, the meeting is denied. So on day 90, 
sponsor is expected to submit the meeting one uh, package and uh, the first meeting is expected around the day 120. Then on day 150, a uh, sponsor is expected to submit the meeting two package and the second meeting is expected around the day 240. Um, so as noted by the FDA CID guidance, um, if a sponsor believes that feedback received at the first meeting is sufficient and does not want a second meeting before initiating the trial, the sponsor may choose to finalize the protocol submitted to the IND and begin enrolling patients. So uh, next slide. So this slide highlights the key discussions with FDA at each of the pilot program interaction points uh, for this uh, lupus study. Uh, so after uh, the meeting request being submitted, uh, disclosure agreement reached and the Amgen being accepted to the program, uh, FDA provided a written uh, feedback on the proposed study design and made recommendations on high-level design features, such as reducing certain adaptive elements to simplify the design and make it more feasible for simulation evaluation and uh, study execution. Um, FDA also set expectations on simulation results to be included in the meeting one package, uh, for example, operating characteristics, uh, simulation replicates, and the nuisance parameters to be explored. Uh, during meeting one, uh, discussions were focused on key uh, innovative elements of the proposed design, uh, which may will discuss in more detail later, uh, in particular, uh, response adaptive randomization and the Bayesian hierarchical models. Um, this is against uh, potential alternatives and how Amgen can demonstrate advantages of these design features uh, based on operating characteristics generated from modeling and the simulations. And a wide range of uh, efficacy scenarios and the plausible nuisance parameter spaces were discussed in great detail to ensure sufficient evaluations of a chance of erroneous conclusions and the reliable estimate of treatment effect. And during uh, meeting one, we also discussed the uh, appropriateness of the primary endpoint with FDA, uh, including their clinical outcome assessment representative and the processes in trial conduct to ensure trial integrity. Um, in meeting two, which is the final meeting in the pilot program, uh, FDA confirmed that Amgen had largely addressed the concerns and the implemented suggestions to demonstrate that the proposed uh, uh, CID was appropriate as a registrational study uh, the remaining discussions were on additional work to further strengthen the design proposal package, including a comparison to uh, alternative methods, uh, for example, a normal dynamic linear model and uh, the DENET procedure to evaluate uh, multiple doses um, as compared to the Bayesian hierarchical model as the favorable method. Um, additional information to justify the range of some nuisance parameters, such as control response rate and the concordance between adjacent visits. Um, the need to have a data access plan was also discussed and it was requested to be submitted along with a future study protocol. So next slide. As we all know, FDA released the final guidance on adaptive clinical trials in 2019. Um, this guidance outlines four key principles that must be met for a trial to be intended to provide a substantial evidence of effectiveness of, uh, for a product. Uh, these are 
adequate control of the chance for erroneous conclusions, uh, sufficiently reliable estimation of treatment effects, uh, pre-specification of trial planning, and the maintenance of trial integrity. Um, this, uh, the CID uh, pilot program experience really highlighted the, the agency's commitment to these four principles. And the May will uh, describe in a few minutes more detail on how they were discussed and addressed in the context of the, um, our experience on this uh, lupus study. Next slide. Um, I would say that the overall experience we had for this uh, 592 CID pilot program in interactions with FDA are very positive. Uh, it allowed for a um, unique opportunity for the team to engage with the technical experts at the agency, uh, discuss the design and its innovative features in a very collaborative manner. Uh, through this engagement, uh, we were able to align on the design and the gain agency agreements on the ability of this proposed design to serve as a registrational study for AMG 592 um, in lupus. Uh, next slide. Additionally, on a broader scale, uh, these types of designs have a benefits that are important for patients uh, for this particular drug development, as well as for the sponsor. Um, from the patient perspective, considerations of these innovative features uh, allowed for efficiencies, both when the product is effective by maximizing exposure of patients to the best performing dose, and when it's not effective by allowing the study to stop early. Um, for this drug development program as a whole, it got streamlined by allowing for a reduction in the white space between phase two and phase three, and uh, to reduce the number of studies required to support registration. Overall, um, we expect the cost of failure is reduced and the probability of success is improved. Um, lastly, from the sponsor perspective, participation in this uh, CID pilot program was a unique opportunity for sponsors to collaborate with the agency to improve drug development efficiency and also to build the capabilities in innovative trial design, modeling, and simulation and execution, which Tony uh, will discuss later. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to hand over to May uh, to talk about more detail about the study design. May. Let me unmute myself. Hold on. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm going to go to the next. There is a delay in uh, page down. Some reason. Oops, my page down not working all of a sudden. Let me see if this will work. Okay. Sorry, everyone. Um, I'm Maymo. Um, so the next slide, I'm going to show the study schema of the study um, Amy just described. At first glance, this is a schema of a very typical phase two dose ranging study with a placebo arm and three different doses um, randomized at one to one to one um, at the beginning um, of the trial. And indeed, that's one of the objective of this um, phase two B study. However, there is another objective, which is the, the very focus of the CID program is um, we are through this design, try to make this trial to provide substantial evidence that is to qualify as an adequate and well-controlled trial um, as a potential registrational study and to replace um, one of the, the future phase twos 
uh, a phase three uh, study. Um, so one difference you can see in this uh, schema is that the primary endpoint is um, a response rate at week 52, which um, is typically being used in phase three trials instead of phase two. This is the schedule of uh, interim analysis uh, planned for the study. As you can see, many interim analysis are planned um, up to eight. And start from um, the first interim analysis up to um, and before all subjects are in, in, uh, enrolled. Um, response adaptive randomization will be carried out. Um, in this uh, uh, randomization, we are allocating patients at the beginning as I said, equal um, allocation to uh, treatment arms. And later on, it will be um, adjusted to reflect the more uh, promising dose. And starting from the second interim analysis, futility analysis will be carried out. Um, so if none of the treatment arm have the promise to reaching target treatment effect, then um, the trial will be terminated early. And at the last interim analysis, which is planned around week 24, um, after all subject being enrolled, um, because we believe week 24 results highly predicting week 52, the primary endpoint, um, this um, particular analysis is used to um, inform future phase three design, but the information will not be used in any way to impact the current trial and the study team will be remain blinded to the results. So um, the RER and interim analysis for futility and this administrative look to trigger future study are um, two of the innovative features. The last innovative feature is the Bayesian hierarchical model, which we used for the primary analysis. Therefore, the final results will not be based on a p-value, rather based on a Bayesian uh, posterior probability. So here are some rationales why we're choosing those um, innovative trial design features. Um, for response adaptive randomization, allow us to learn from accumulating data from the ongoing trial. And it's beneficial for patients because um, this method will reduce the exposure of patients to less effective treatment. And in, by increasing patients on and data collected from the more promising arm, we also um, increase efficacy and safety data collection. Um, the second feature is uh, interim analysis for futility, as well as you, you saw a um, administrative uh, success signal. So this will stop patients' exposure, of course, to non-effective treatment because um, a, a futile trial will stop early. It will also reduce the cost of failure for sponsor and uh, shorten the development timeline time even for um, a successful case. Um, this will reduce, uh, in case the trial uh, futile, and the uh, remaining cost and uh, resource can be redirected to other more promising program. So that increase uh, drug development efficiency. And the Bayesian hierarchical model can dynamically borrow across active treatment arms if they are similar, which improve the estimation of treatment effect. And by using this model, one um, advantage is that um, we do not need to um, have a, a specific assumption of the dose response um, curve. So um, it doesn't need to be monotonically increasing or a particular pattern. So now I'm going to get into a little bit more detail of uh, um, how we um, build a response adaptive randomization um, model. So um, as said earlier, um, with accumulating data, we will start to see um, each of the treatment group, how, how strong the efficacy is. And then for each of the treatment group, we were estimating um, what's the probability of this arm being um, the arm with the highest response uh, rate. And then um, using that probability to drive the future allocation 
of uh, randomization ratio. And you can decide um, the different weights that we've given to this probability. And I wouldn't go into detail uh, of that. It can be more aggressive or um, less aggressive, but uh, modeling simulation can tune that to the, to the uh, most optimized um, allocation. And the posterior probability of the dose being the highest dose, of course, will be estimated using a Bayesian independent model, because in this particular exercise, we do not like borrowing to happen, because that will make the dose look like more similar. And in this case, we want to highlight the differences. The second feature we like to uh, highlight is the Bayesian hierarchical model, as discussed earlier and also um, Amy mentioned. Um, by using this model, we can borrow strength across very um, active treatment arms with similar efficacy. Uh, and by doing that, we shrink the estimation variability and therefore strengthen the treatment effect estimates. And in this model, um, we will borrow more when the dose um, responses are very similar and borrow less or even none if they are not. Um, and the, the advantage of using Bayesian hierarchical model um, in addition is, as you can see, there's no assumption of a treatment response pattern. Um, so we don't have to assume in, um, monotonic non-decreasing pattern from low, uh, medium to high dose. And as Amy mentioned earlier, FDA guidance very much highlighted uh, four principles for um, clinical trials um, meant to establish um, uh, substantial evidence. So um, this is the first principle that um, we need to control um, the rate of erroneous conclusion. And as we all know, uh, as statistician, um, the most important um, uh, erroneous uh, decision is type one error, where the treatment is not effective. However, we draw the wrong conclusion, suggest uh, the treatment um, is. And in this um, CID case, we actually um, evaluate um, type one error across null space, um, a wide range of null space. And um, the first type of null space we call global null, which is a very straightforward and typically we, we consider so in this setting would be, there's no treatment effect in any of the treatment arms, the low, medium, high dose. And further we push, um, further uh, there's also no treatment effect at any time point during that 52 week treatment period post randomization. Um, this is because um, our analysis method, right? Well, using information across treatment arms and our longitudinal model will also looking at the treatment effect across 10 points. Um, so which will, I will ex, ex, uh, elaborate later. So in this very simple, unlikely, <laughs> very strict cases we call global now, no treatment effect whatsoever. Then um, we evaluate across many nuisance parameters and nuisance parameter in this case is related to the tri operational design as thinking about enrollment rate um, and uh, uh, from slow to, to fast, and uh, um, if there is a ramping up. And we're also looking at uh, control response rate, and we know it's always uh, variable um, through historical trials. And for longitudinal model, we're also looking at uh, the correlation pattern um, across um, the 52 weeks, how visit to visit are correlated, high or low. And um, type one error will be defined as we reject now in this global case across any possible control rate, any possible enrollment rate, any, any possible correlation. And we did evaluation across all those combination. Um, it's a full factorial combination of scenarios. And as you can see through um, our modeling simulation results, we show a strong control of type one error. Um, there was one that above it, because if the true, um, uh, let's say, um, type 1 error is indeed less than or equal to um, 0 0.025, through modeling simulation, there occasionally will be points outside um, this range. But we were looking at uh, uh, across univariate pattern 
of uh, enrollment rate and control rate and also um, correlation pattern, try to see if um, any um, like these show a linear pattern that uh, increase type one error. And we found within reasonable possible range of those nuisance parameters, the chance um, we exceeding type one error rate um, is um, extremely small. So now I'm gonna go to um, second type of uh, um, null space. This is we learned um, through our interaction with um, FDA. And um, the first question is, what if um, one or two of the uh, uh, three doses are indeed null and when the others uh, may be effective? Um, what's the type one error if we um, wrongfully claim the ineffective dose to be effective? So we start to realize that's also a null case. Um, in addition, what if there are early treatment effects, let's say um, at week 16, week 24, um, but later on um, patients loss effect at the primary endpoint, um, 10 point, which is week 52, and will we wrongfully claim um, effective treatment? So with that, you can see um, your, um, because I'm, I'm looking at the screen, I, I don't know if my cursor work. Yeah, you can see the nugget case is only one dose is effective. Um, the plateau case is we have two equally effective uh, dose, but uh, one dose is not. So we want to demonstrate that th those ineffective dose will not be um, wrongfully claimed to be significant. And also um, the drop one pattern, you can see there are target efficacy at early 10 points at week 16 through week 24. However, at week 52, there is no treatment effect. And we also wanna make sure we don't cause type one error there. So as you can see through this exercise um, and in the CID um, interaction, we re really raise the bar for the study even higher than um, traditional when we plan a clinical trial. And as uh, um, discussed earlier, for the entire null space, um, we um, simulated to show a strong control of type 1 error. And as FDA guidance indicated, we simulated a 100K um, simulation for each combination of those scenarios. Now I'm going to go to the uh, second type of erroneous um, conclusion, which is type two error. So we start looking across all different efficacy scenarios. We would have moderate efficacy, a good efficacy, which is the target, and a great efficacy, even better than our target case. And we could have efficacy in a nugget case, as I showed earlier, only one dose is effective, or in a plateau case, like every dose are effective, but um, not differentiable. Um, and different uh, other um, cases where one dose is not effective, but um, two of the doses are at um, similar efficacy. And we also uh, assuming different longitudinal uh, patterns, whether efficacy will, will um, start to show at week 16 and hold constant all the way through, and or there is different uh, um, increasing of efficacy all the way to um, the end of week 52, um, or there are the peak efficacy actually show somewhere in the middle and decreasing, but still there. So, and also different efficacy increasing pattern across different dose levels. So there are many, um, those scenarios um, were determined through our interaction with the agency. And then you can see quickly with uh, the nuisance parameters and different efficacy patterns and different longitudinal pattern and if we do full factorial, um, the scenario is already hundreds. Um, if I recall correctly, it was like uh, uh, about 400 scenarios. And if we evaluate each of them, um, the results, it's not only burdensome for modeling simulation, it's also difficult um, to have a comprehensive look to evaluate the trial. So we negotiate with the agency and, and uh, try to fix um, for nuisance parameter we fix two parameter um, at the most possible value and the varying um, univariately um, the third parameter and looking for, for the full space and evaluating um, the type two error. 
And as this slide can show is um, we evaluate three trial design. One is the fixed design. Um, that's the conventional one with no um, adaptation and no RAR. And we also um, did um, two trial. Um, when we say no Bayesian, so it's no Bayesian hierarchical model, but uh, RAR will be applied. Or no IR means um, no response adaptive randomization, but Bayesian um, hierarchical model applied. And our proposed design, which is the blue line, um, including all features. And as you can see across all different uh, efficacy scenario, the blue line is at least equal or better than um, the other designs. So other than probability of su success, which is um, end of trial, we will have a successful trial given um, um, good scenario. We also evaluated other OCs like probability of uh, causing cough utility. Of course, cough utility in all case or low efficacy case is a good thing, but cough utility for target or even better cases is not. And we're also looking at uh, probability uh, we are able to call early success to plan phase three, um, probability selecting the, the best or correct dose, and also average randomized subject looking at uh, um, cost saving in cases of futile case. So the second principle is looking at uh, the sufficient uh, reliable estimate of treatment effect. Um, this one, um, we did exercises using a target um, efficacy scenario where one of the dose giving a target efficacy and the other two doses giving moderate level of efficacy. And um, we agreed with um, FDA to, to contrasting um, our Bayesian hierarchical model, which will borrow strengths across treatment arms and the Dunnet method, which is a multiplicity control method and um, the estimation of treatment effect actually do not have any borrow cross treatment arms. And when we're looking at um, the results, so these are the results coming from um, like the estimate of selected uh, the best dose moving forward to phase three. Um, as expected, because that's the strongest dose, um, you can see using Bayesian hierarchical model because we borrow um, the efficacy estimate is slightly lower um, um, because uh, uh, we borrow the strengths from the less effective doses. Um, so it's biased to the negative side. Um, the magnitude is very small, like less than um, 3%, as you can see. And it's conservative because we, um, the chance we overestimate treatment effect or reporting a, um, a better treatment effect than um, the real um, uh, the true effect is, um, is very small. However, we believe um, the uh, reliable estimate of treatment effect is not only in the absolute bias, it's also in mean square error, meaning the precision of the estimate. So when we compare um, each of the simulated trial, the treatment effect against the true effect that we, uh, we know, um, we said at the simulation, then we can um, see that by contrasting the method, um, Bayesian hierarchical model uh, performing a lot better across the majority of the cases um, than done it because it's shrinking the variance and give a more precise estimate. So therefore, overall, we believe that um, um, Bayesian hierarchical model is actually slightly superior to done it test in this case, which we reached agreement with that DA. So let's go to the third um, principle, which uh, is a pre as um, all adaptive design, we need to pre-specify a lot of the analysis and algorithms and decision rules. So um, I'm going to revisit this uh, um, analysis schedule. So all the interim analysis, the 10 point of interim analysis and all the um, um, what decision will be made, um, RER or futility or success are all pre-specified. And also the futility stopping rule um, is based on a, a Bayesian um, a posterior probability of like if all the treatment um, arms um, are, are not, uh, have a very low probability to hitting the target treatment effect, um, we will stop. 
and administrative success is based a uh, uh, Bayesian um, post, uh, predictive probability of success of a um, hypothetical future phase three that uh, um, we designed, um, but uh, uh, based on the efficacy we saw from the current trial. So if um, probability is very high, predictive probability is very high, then we could trigger the preparation of a future phase three trial. And the primary uh, analysis success criteria, as I um, highlighted earlier, will not be based on p-value, rather than based on a threshold of posterior probability. And this value is set through um, many modeling um, simulation results to ensure the, the um, basic optimized to control type one error also optimize um, type uh, basic power. So the last principle, not the least, is the principle to ensure trial um, integrity because adaptive trial, um, we will look at interim data. So firewall is extremely important. So externally um, for this type of trial, um, the interim analysis will be mainly looked at uh, by external um, DMC, Data Monitoring Committee. And um, we will make sure that uh, the um, DMC fully understand our trial design um, and uh, um, basically understand the pre-specified adaptation plan. Internally, we um, also um, build a data access plan, which is highly um, is required per FDA to make sure that uh, um, internal um, sponsor member access to the data is, um, is, is restricted only um, under very rare extreme cases. For example, um, DMC um, recommend futility of the trial. Um, or recommend um, early, um, the early planning of phase three. And um, we also um, need to make sure because um, very important decisions are made during the uh, process. We um, make sure the high um, quality interim data are ready for use for each of the interim um, decision making. So with that, I think I'll pass on to Tony to carry on to um, more detail of the simulation work and some demo. Can you, can you hear me? Let, uh, may, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I mean, we can. Uh, maybe let me share through my end now because uh, you know it will include a demo. Okay, then I'll stop sharing. Yes, please, thank you. Let me make sure I share the right screen. Okay. Um, can you guys see the slides in full screen? Or it's not in a presentation mode yet. Okay. I think again I'm sharing the wrong screen. So because when I went to full screen, it goes to the other one. How about now? Still not it, it, full screen, Tony. Okay, great. Thank you. No, no, it's not. It's still not. Not? Yeah, it's the presenter uh, appearance screen. Sorry, just give me one second. I think we have enough time, so hopefully it won't take more than two minutes. Yeah, no worries. Before I before I unplug my other screen. <laughs> I think. Tony, you can select the booklet icon during your presentation and it will be show all right at the full screen. Um, sorry, I find out where my screen is. Are you, uh, are you seeing my screen now? It's still the presenter preparation. Yeah, you just go to the display settings to make it, a, you know. Swap it, the it, screen. It fine, yeah, just swap the screen. Display setting. Okay, got it. Here? 
No, going back to the previous screen. Yeah, once it go to the full screen mode, if you go up. Uh, I think this has to work now because this is my only screen now. How about now? It's not full screen, but we can see it. Yep. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I've been back. close to all my other screens, right? So uh, sorry about this technical delay. And thanks everyone for being here. And thanks um, Amy and May for a great, very detailed introduction already on our, um, on our, on our CID design. So here I'm gonna talk about sort of some of our experiences in terms of how we did our simulation, right? Because really that's a really big part uh, of the CID and it's uh, we, we've done a tremendous amount of mod uh, simulation and it's a huge undertaking so I really want to share our experiences uh, throughout the process. So as you probably already heard from uh, Amy and May, our Amgen team in consultant with the FDA has conducted an extensive simulation study to evaluate the CID design and more importantly after that we've developed a comprehensive simulation report uh, with the table of content shown here, along with the full results and code files, we, and we submitted it with, to the FDA according to adaptive design guidance recommendation. So here is a table of content for the simulation report. And we really lay out the objectives, for example, and we lay out the study design options, the model setup, including everything, for example, May has mentioned the clinical scenarios, the sensitivity scenarios, and the analysis model that we have done for primary analysis, interim analysis, how we handle missing data. And very importantly, obviously for CID, how we did our interim analysis, how we did our RAR, fertility, et cetera, and the, uh, how, what kind of operating characteristics we're gonna um, be summarizing here. And, also a section, we also summarized results. And obviously there's, you know, maybe hundreds of results out there. So lots of them are in um, backup and supplementary, but we've find creative ways to, to um, summarize important results um, into this simulation results section, uh, which obviously the, uh, the very important part of type one error evaluation, we've spent a lot of time, we've spent a lot of effort and time on it with the global null scenario and type one error under non-global null scenarios. And we've simulated, uh, we've summarized efficacy scenarios uh, with some, you know, we could, you know, obviously there are close to 500 efficacy scenarios based on our uh, nuisance parameters um, and efficacy scenarios combination. So we summarize things according to certain interests and also uh, in the mind or in, in the spirit of full transparency, we've attached every um, scenarios for review. And also, as I will show a shiny apps that we're very, will very transparently show all this, all the results. So for, uh, for example, for FDA's examination, if they want to do that. And the prior con consideration on the hierarchical variance parameter is very important because it controls a lot of the borrowing, for example. and also, this um, per FDA's feedback, we've done comparisons to other designs to really showcase that this is, you know, we, we've done adaptive design for a reason, right? We, we're not doing adaptive design just for the sake of doing adaptive design, but we're doing it because it's performing better to give us adv real advantages in terms of timeline, cost, et cetera, to, to advance our clinical development programs. And example trials are very important because some of the details is going to be buried in the devil of averages, right, in terms of operating characteristics. So in the simulation report, we have included two um, example trials, one for a success case, one for a futility case. Um, but again, we are um, fully transparent in the sense that you can literally examine, um, I would say, close to every um, simulated trial that we have, uh, we have done, right? So, 
And, and we, uh, in Amgen, we have a centralized uh, design and simulation team. And at that time of the CID, I was leading the simulation team. And now they're really literally based on the experience we have here, right? Now the simulation report has been a controlled document at Amgen where it's, uh, for example, similar to things like SAP, where we've uh, taken this as an example to develop our, um, uh, our templates so that we can apply this to more programs in the future. So next slide. Okay, this will work. I will, I will briefly talk about the simulation scope, right? I think May already mentioned a lot of them. We have um, eight scenarios in total where uh, one of them is a global null and we have, uh, and two of them are local now in the sense of there was one or more doses, but not all are not, literally not working, right? And we also have some moderate uh, efficacious scenario, good efficacious scenario, great, great scenarios, and some other, for example, equal and plateau scenarios. So we have eight uh, clinical scenarios in total. And then of course, the big part lies in nuisance parameter, right? We have control arm responses we've done meta-analysis um, to identify a reasonable, but also pretty conservative large range of the control response rate for, uh, for SLE, because um, SLE obviously has pretty high control rate. So this is something very important. And we've examined many accrual rate, um, and I can talk a little bit more detail when I show this uh, Shiny app. And also the longitudinal pattern on how um, uh, how our responses evolve over time for any of the given clinical scenarios, all right? So, uh, so all in all, we uh, and also the concordance, meaning that how what's literally basically just the correlation on uh, right um, the different definition of correlation between adjacent visits in terms of response. So. Um, all in all, it has a lot of combinations, right? So we've sort of divided and conquered for uh, type one error scenarios. We've uh, been very um, st uh, strict for, uh, we've been very strict and we've done the, basically the, uh, all the combinations possible for a type one error evaluation. But for um, uh, efficacy scenarios, first of all, there are obviously way more cases in efficacy if you consider things like clinical scenarios. So we've uh, tried to narrow it down a little bit to a reasonable range and then uh, find creative ways as I will show later to showcase some of the patterns in terms of uh, operating characteristics, All right? And we've uh, uh, performed the simulation according to the adaptive design guidance where for the type one error, for each of them, there are 72 scenarios. Uh, the, all the results are based on a hundred thousand simulations per scenario, right? Which approximately pro uh, provides an accuracy of 0.01 with 95% confidence. And for efficacy scenarios, we've performed a 10,000 simulations per scenario, which is of, of course is a little bit uh, less accurate, but it's more tolerable just because of um, just because of the, the numbers you're looking at, right? Which is obviously larger than 0.025. And as I said, uh, May has talked already talked very extensively about the type one error, but I want to give you some ideas of what, on how we um, su summarize the efficacy scenarios, because literally there are many of them there, because it's close to 400 of them. And I think in the simulation report, in the actual text, we've tried to narrow things down to, to, to things that are important and that give people a general idea of the design. And for example, Right, we've given out the fully uh, operating characteristics under the default nuisance parameters, right? With everything range around probability success, right? And number of randomized number of subjects probably selecting the best dose and bias is IMSE, right? So we really focused on the default case. And for the other cases, we will try to highlight some of those that are more extreme than others. For example, in terms of bias, we've summarized the 10 scenarios with largest bias and give that the, the combination of nuisance parameter that, uh, that produces those biases, right? And then this really can highlight um, some of the uh, important pattern uh, of the design ac uh, across these 400 uh, um, also scenarios. 
And, and also um, beyond that, as I said, in the supplement and in the, in the shiny app, in the code and the results we submitted, uh, all, all of the results are available, right? So if anybody wants to take a closer look at any of the scenarios that they're interested in, uh, they can feel free to do so after reading the text that we highlighted. And we have example trials um, submitted, as I said, two of them in the simulation report, but we'll also develop a shiny app uh, to visualize the example trials with complete transparency. And those are the two example trials that we have in the simulation report, right? We've summarized how the enrollment goes, right? In terms of how many people enrolled and how many people has which to response uh, available, and the pattern of uh, the probability of being the best dose, which is going to affect the RER, and the pattern of posterior probability, right, and how it fractures over time. And then uh, this is a, a this is a successful trial, right? So we will see it goes to the end, and there will be a futile trial, for example, where you only have three. Scenario uh, uh, interim analysis, and somehow the futility has been uh, has been triggered in all three doses, and then you just call it a stop. And those are operating characteristics. Uh, I'm not going to go into details, but it's just pretty um, pretty comprehensive in terms of what we have looked at. I'm going to switch gear, go to the demo first before coming back to to close out the presentation. So let me. See if this still works. Yes, I think this is still works. That's great. Let me just test it. So we've, again, this has been a sort of cornerstone case for us to test our, not only our statistical capabilities, but also our technical capability, right? So we worked really um, with our colleagues in Amgen and FDA, right, to try to uh, make sure that we can use this case to really build up some of our capabilities. And this, we have internal Shiny app uh, servers where we, uh, we develop this Shiny app and host it. And it's not a simulator, right? Because the simulation itself is going to take a long time. But we really, we are able to use this to load the simulation and achieve almost complete transparency in terms of uh, the, the, the performance of the trial, right? For example, in this uh, application, we have a design overview, right? that sort of lays out the, the technical specs of the design. And we have an example trial section where you load- Tony, you... Tony are you showing the demo? It's uh, not, uh, the screen hasn't changed. It's still on the previous slide. Yeah. You okay. can... I think it's frozen. Let me do it again. Yeah, here we go. Okay, okay. great. I think it was frozen, yeah. So uh, basically this is the Shiny app. Right on our Amgen internal server. And we have design overview, as I said, um, uh, that lays out the spec of the design that you have already seen. And then we have this example trial section that allows you to load the results, right, in the Excel file and the CSV file, and literally examine any, any of the uh, simulation results you want to you show. And for example, if you want to look at the null case, right, and you can, uh, specify which simulation to look at. You want to look at the first uh, simulation. And uh, by the way, we have uh, sort of calculated how many <laughs> simulated trials that we have done throughout the process. It's close to 14 million, right? So it's really a lot of them. And so it's really a test of our computational capability and our ability to really summarize things among them, right? So, so uh, I think we've obviously we've spent a lot of time on it, but I also feel like we learn a lot through the process. So for example, in null scenario, you are, uh, if you want to focus on the first simulation, right? You, you can, it's actually a little bit of uh, animation that you can do, right? It, as it goes on, you will see how the enrollment progresses in terms of how many people are uh, enrolled and how many reached week 52 across different doses. And you can see how the probability of best dose have evolved over being the best dose. As you can see in the end, uh, the, this is the, I think the mid medium dose actually uh, stands out. But again, this is just by chance, right? But nevertheless, none of the dose actually um, works, right? So it's still a pretty low probability. 
And you can also examine another one. Let's just increase the second one. And you can do the same thing. And as it's already given, <laughs> it's got a revelation here that the second one actually didn't went far, uh, right? It didn't go far. It went to the third simulation and the fertility has already been triggered for all three cases, right? You're able to see a full transparency, right, of uh, the allocation probability of Bestos ratio, what's been observed and what's been modeled, right? The fertility and efficacy for every interim analysis of every trial, right? So I think that sort of uh, really achieved the, the full transparency and avoid something, for example, you are selectively select cases that looks better, right? So we, we tried, absolutely try not to do that. We wanna give out the full picture of what's going on. Right. And you can also look at operating character. Uh, let's just look at another case, right? For example, you can look at the grade case. You can pick any of, uh, let's see, maybe we can look at just a random case. And then again, this is a case where you have dose dependent efficacy and the efficacy is actually pretty good. And as you can see, there's initial some randomness as you expected, the second dose is doing the best up until the third interim, right? But again, then uh, it, it, goes, it, the, the, it goes up, the, the, first, the, the true uh, results, right? Uh, are the true results of the first, uh, the high dose being the best dose started to emerge at the first force one and guided the adaptive uh, uh, resp uh, response randomization. Uh, in the end, you're enrolling 113 at the high dose and only 34 at the low dose, right? So that's sort of, a, as opposed to if you just took, don't do RIR, you're only enrolling 80 on your best dose basically, right? And you can see how it never went even close to futility. And then again, you're, you're, you can look at every uh, detail and you can also look at the uh, operating characteristics. You load um, some of the results in. I preloaded because the loading, again, very lot of scenarios, the loading takes a while, but you can rearrange the scenarios and then look at the efficacy scenario, right? And the uh, operating characteristics um, that we produced basically. And you can, we of, of course, we have a very um, zoomed effort on type 1 arrow. So those are the 72 type 1 arrows with one slightly above uh, 0.025, as May already said, it's 0.0252, right? But overall, I feel like it's controlling the type 1 arrow pretty well, at least uh, for global now. And you can actually examine things by uh, the type one arrow by uh, the nuisance parameters, the three nuisance parameters to see if there's a trend. Actually, we've we've seen a trend in accrual rate and also uh, the control rate and accrual rate, right? And in fact, in the process, we re even react to it, for example, for accrual rate, we've tested something very extreme accrual rate, right? That's, that's never going to be actually achieved in actual trial but to find out it's still okay in that case. So that trend sort of actually stopped here, right? And then uh, of course for control rate, we rely heavily on the meta-analysis to guide us what's are, what are the possible scenarios, right? Cause you, you're, uh, of course we feel like we're not responsible for things that can never happen in reality. Yeah, and you can do different kind of cross-examination um, you can look at the non-global null scenarios. I'm not going to go into details, but it's the basically, full, again, full transparency, right? Each dots, you can look at what kind of scenario produce what kind of results, right? I think that's the demo, and I'll just come back to my slide and close it out. Um, we, and the Prudufa and, um, Prudufa, uh, and the, the Prudufa 6 and the 21st Century Cure Act provides very exciting- uh, Tony, Tony, hold on, we're not seeing your slides. Probably delayed again. My frozen again, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think. Yep. There we go, Good. yeah. Green, change to full screen. Mm. Thank you. Yep. Yes, 
And as Amy has mentioned, right, the Pazufa 6 and 21st Century Cures Act provide exciting opportunities for industry to collaborate with re regulatory agencies to promoting use of CID and providing the FDA an opportunity to communicate this advance publicly. And as we have or seen here, right, and the CR CID can help improve efficiency in clinical programs throughout the drug development cycle. And our partnership with FDA on SLD, CI, SLE CID pilot program to drive the development of a new treatment for lupus to address unmet need for patients. And we appreciate FDA's efforts, significant contribution and feedback provided throughout the pro pilot process, with it especially also including the simulation process, right? The, the, the sort of spec that you see is a lot of discussion with FDA and they provide a very comprehensive and, and helpful feedback uh, to drive the final sort of scope of the simulation. And we also like to acknowledge uh, OEN, um, Amgen Biostatistics, right? And especially Barry Consultant, we, uh, we uh, collaborated extensively with Scott and Joe on this project, right? And of course, this is going to be a cross-functional effort. So we've uh, lots of Amgen clinical development colleagues and regular colleagues has helped. So we wanna give them a, a, a round of applause here as well. So uh, that's it for me, and I think that's it for us for today. And I'll, uh, Frida, I'll stop here and uh, see if people have any questions. Yes, thank you so much for all the speakers. And uh, I, I just am amazed to see the great details in the presentation. I really appreciate CID that this pilot program that provides us this platform to discuss scientific work in this type of details. So I, I can see one question coming through. Um, the first question I'll just repeat is uh, from Marati from the DSI. It says, uh, I wonder how is it possible to control the type one error if you are borrowing information across the treatment arms? It is expected that there is a type one error inflation when there is borrowing information using BHM. So who want to take it? I, I can try. <laughs> Tony or Amy, you want me to take it? Yeah, go ahead. OK, so um, it's a great question. And uh, actually, it's true in that way. So we, um, I, I want to uh, get into, this is the detail I, I uh, didn't plan to get into. So think about this case is when we borrow information cross treatment arms and uh, the inflation of type one error probably will be um, most severe or raising severe concern is when let's say one uh, like two doses are not effective and one dose is. Those are the, the cases I, I show as the nugget, right? Or um, actually in this setting, because we borrow strength to the actually ineffective treatment arm and uh, make the ineffective treatment uh, not reaching statistical significance. But think about when that is happening, right? There are for sure going to be doses showing stronger result than that with uh, more allocation and uh, stronger efficacy results. So the chance that we actually will select that dose moving forward to phase three will be very slim. So we agreed with the agency that is for type one error, we really should be defined is um, the decision-making is not only we reaching so-called statistical significance, right? Um, which is the posterior probability uh, for that ineffective dose. Also that dose showing us the strongest to carry forward to phase three is very small. And that's how the simulation show. Um, do I answer the question? Merti, if you're online, feel free to unmute yourself. And I agree, that's extensively discussed. Uh, you say yes. I, I, okay. Thanks. Anybody, if you have a question, please feel free to type in chat or unmute yourself. I, I want to add one sentence on top of May's answer is that 
I think this is obviously a very, a very true uh, for every uh, sort of borrowing problem, especially to this group. I think that probably everybody here knows it. But of course, we didn't shy away with it. Right? We did extensive simulation to quantify what's the inflation under the worst scenarios. Right. And that's the non-global now that we showed. And we discussed with the agency with those numbers at hand. Yeah, it's a huge package of the yeah. simulation to, to get, uh, get to that uh, mutual understanding um, on all this. Okay, we have another question from Richard. So I said, how did you choose the frequency of interim analysis RAR updates? Mm -hmm. That's a really good the logistic question. question. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, um, I have to say, it's a balance in between um, like the, um, of course, statistical property. Um, we want more frequent interim analysis to be able to um, update RER so we can effectively allocate patients to um, the desired treatment arm. But at the same time, we also have to um, consider operation um, challenges and efficiency. So this is um, discussed. I think uh, we um, agreed not, not to disclose exactly uh, when those interims are happening. So I can say this is uh, really strike a balance there. And also statistically not doing continuous RER isn't another thing because um, in between two randomization ratio period, you can consider that intent to treat period, right? So. Um, randomization during that period is um, you should be unbiased. Although along the time, maybe there is a drift of different patient come in, then um, that's that's the time trend that they was worried about. So setting um, enough patients in between each period allow you to potentially asking, uh, estimating treatment effect for each period, which is uh, by uh, theory unbiased and you can pull them together through some kind of uh, Cochrane mental Hensel type of method. So to ensure overall estimation is unbiased. So that's a lot of consideration get in there where we choosing the interim analysis frequency and also um, how many subjects in between. Hopefully that answers your question. And we have another question from Meritip. Did you look at a scenario where the low or medium dose is better than the higher dose? If there is no monotonic relationship, it could be possible the low medium dose may have better efficacy, especially if the high dose is toxic. Right. I, that question comes, Caesar. I know <laughs> Tony, you're gonna jump to it. Tony, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I'll just briefly explain it. Right, as we've seen in many lupus trials, uh, we've actually seen U-shaped the curve before. Right, and not that we know why, probably, but uh, it's actually irrelevant in our case, right? Because we're using Bayesian hierarchical model, which is, uh, which is sort of order free, right? So you you can assume uh, the mid dose is the is the best. You you will, all the results will be the same. You just have to swap labels labels and call the median dose high, and that's it. Yeah, it's so, exactly so it's the covered. same result, right? Yeah, it, it's covered. Great, thanks. I don't see, oh, okay, another question from Xiaofei. What kind of computation source you used? How many CPUs? Uh, how long does the simulation take? Actually, that was my question sure. too. All right, I can, I can answer this question. We actually did two rounds of simulation, as you showed with a collaborative spirit very consultant, right? So we did uh, our initial simulation in facts, and then we have also uh, sort of a, a, a mod, uh, basically verify it using our own internal development programming R, right? And I don't recall have an exact number of how many CPUs that we used, but what I can say is that uh, a lot, yes, yes. But, and, and it was a lot of effort working with our IT department to set things up. And we've run those on, on AWS servers. Yes. Yeah, I can say currently we can run up to 20, 200 core. But we really need to. Wow. Any more questions? 
I want to follow up to ask if uh, maybe you already covered it. If the uh, outputs from the app was directly feeding to the uh, simulation report, what do you basically copy paste a lot of figures into the simulation report? I was just curious. Uh, I think we developed the simulation report manually. All right. Uh, I see. Yeah, we, we have an Excel file of everything and we've just um, did, did that writing manually, yeah. We did copy paste, right? No, but yeah. The, yeah. the key thing is you have a, you need the simulation report to be comprehensive. Mm -hmm. So you have to selectively um, select the outputs that address the question or the key concerns. Um, and then, um, but the whole simulation package is a separate thing um, we're submitting through, let's say a module five setting. So with a reviewer's guide um, to, to um, basically communicate to the agency how to navigate through our programs, our generate data sets and outputs. Hey, thanks. I don't see other questions coming in, but I have one last question. You guys have uh, run millions of simulations. It's just a shocking number. Uh, you have a lot of experience in RAR. I wonder if you can say something about RAR usage in master protocol. You have any opinion or? <laughs> I mean, RAR has been used in um master protocol, right? And uh, um, this is presented by uh, Scott Berry um, for um, many of his uh, master protocol trials. And I, I, I am remain open to potentially using that in oncology um, master protocol setting as well, um, where I, I don't uh, feel like we have enough or we're ready to share, but uh, I definitely thinking that's a very powerful um, trial design tool to allocating patients to the treatment arm that is promising for them, um, especially in a uh, extreme like pandemic setting and uh, um, not treating patients with the, uh, the, the best treatment available might be, um, you know, uh, life or death for them, right? So, and for oncology, very similarly. So I, I do um, see there is a lot of uh, opportunity to um, use RER. Actually, the first uh, master protocol on the, the iSpy tool used uh, uh, adaptive randomization, right? Yes. Yeah. And the Ebola trial too, right? Thank you, very thoughtful. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in, and we still have more than 100 participants online. Thank you so much for sticking with us, and I hope you enjoyed this session today. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody, and a thank you to the speakers once more. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Frida. Thanks, all. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Frida, for inviting, and thanks, everyone.